I think we have to understand that when we're looking at some of those communities that have done it historically, it really is centered on no matter what has happened, how can we restore that relationship? Mm -hmm. How we can we bring them back into community? Mm -hmm. How can we understand where they're coming from and the roots of the challenges that have taken place in order to uh, bring them back, understand, repair the harm, hold accountability with the primary purpose of, I see you, I want to be connected with you, despite what has happened, there is an unconditional love and support for that particular person. Welcome to this edition of It's Complicated. My name is Orlando, and today we are talking about restorative justice. What is it? What isn't it? Will it help us? What's going on? Today I'm joined by a superstar. She's beautiful. She's brilliant. She's a talented and passionate educator. She's been an educator for nearly two decades. She spent uh, some time working in a youth corrections uh, facility, working with young men, uh, teaching them phys ed, but more importantly, pouring, in, pouring into them so that they could see their possibilities. Sky Bowen, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you doing today? I am well. Awesome, awesome. You look well. Uh, so restorative justice, right? You know, people in, in this day and age that there's been a lot of conversation about race, about racial relations, about how to be better. There are diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. There are all types of things happening. What is restorative justice? So restorative justice is a belief, a philosophy, a practice that centers on relationship, on community, on understanding the mutual respect of one another. Uh, it really centers on understanding that even when something has happened within community where there has been harm or something significant that has impacted others, that the idea is to understand, to break down what it is that took place, why it happened, and do what we can to reconnect that person or individuals or group of people back into community. Mm -hmm. So when you think about um, uh, some of the things that, that have been challenging us as a community, as a society, on a whole, as it relates to race relations or just communities, right? Getting together or not getting together. Um, you know, I've heard people say that there's no place at this time for restorative justice. Why would someone say something like that? Well, oftentimes, especially in education, but also in other facilities, government institutions, um, prison systems, they have adapted the restorative justice practice, but they've taken some of the most meaningful parts of the work and practice and have taken that out and removed it and created a very colonized system that actually still creates oppressive practices geared towards those who have been significantly harmed. So if you have had a negative experience either in education, policing, government, around restorative justice, oftentimes it doesn't, it's not the practice that's the problem. It's the implementation and the, the idea of how we do restorative justice that has created the problem. Mm -hmm. So how do we do it? Like what, what's the, what, what is it supposed to look like, right? In order to move towards what it was designed to do, right? Like what is it supposed to look like that it doesn't look like in, in many places right now? Well, I mean, we have to take it back to where it actually came from, too, the historical impacts of where restorative justice started from. And a lot of that is rooted in Indigenous communities, Afro-Indigenous communities, global communities around the world that really want to center on uh, being in community with one another. Yeah. Um, oftentimes within Indigenous and Afro-Indigenous communities, there wasn't prison systems. Prison systems was something that was adapted um, as, you know, an Americanized way of, you know, oppressing some of the most, um, you know, innocent bystanders um, a lot of the times and so I think we have to understand that when we're looking at some of those communities that have done it historically it really is centered on no matter what has happened how can we restore that relationship how mm -hmm. we can we bring them back into community mm -hmm. how can we understand where they're coming from and the roots of the challenges that have taken place in order to uh, bring them back understand repair the harm hold accountability with the primary purpose of I see you I want to be connected with you despite what has happened there's an unconditional love and support for that particular person or community so um, what I would say where it's gone wrong especially even in education is they've taken that practice 
but they've also removed the idea of identity, of racism, of you know, heterosexism. All the isms and oppressive practices are still embedded into the restorative justice practice because they have colonized the work and created something that has prevented it from doing what it was really meant and designed to do. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. actually just pre created another form of punishment that really affirms those who are the oppressors mm -hmm. and um, affirms white supremacy culture. Mm -hmm. So what, when you talk about um, you know, restoring relationships and restoring uh, connections to people. What if, you know, I've heard fo some folks argue that some of those connections ne have never existed. Like we've never been in a place where everybody was respected, black, white, no matter what you look like, right? So how do, you, how do we bring restorative justice to a space where, um, you know, the, the consideration is what are we restoring to? because we've never been there before. Yeah, and I think part of that comes from the idea that restorative justice initially was not, is looked at as just a practice, and now people are saying, well, we need to create restorative justice that comes from an anti-racist lens or an anti-oppressive lens. If we have to create a, a system, a practice of philosophy that was already anti-racist and anti-oppressive and now have to rethink it to have it come from an anti-oppressive lens, we're not doing restorative justice in the first place. Yeah. And so what has been a, a challenge, I, I think, and, and I'll speak specifically around education as a teacher, is that you know there are teachers who haven't seen their students in front of them. Yeah. They haven't seen or understand their identity, um, where they are coming from, who they are. Um, and, and, and there are those who uh, are ignorant to the experiences that their students are, are bringing into their classroom. And as a result, it becomes a punitive practice as opposed to being truly restorative. Mm -hmm. So an example would be, you know, you have a student coming into class, they come in five minutes late, they have been rushing, coming from home, they've dropped their, you know, younger sibling off at school, they're coming desperate to get into class, desperate to be in connection with their peers and the teacher, and the teacher immediately says, you're late, you need to go down for a restorative justice conference with somebody else. Right. That's not being restorative, right? You've taken the practice and manipulated it and said, you know, we need to have a conference here, but you haven't even looked or identified or made that connection with that individual who's desperately trying to connect. Right, right. And so we really have to go back to understanding who we are, who we identify as, and understand our own bias, our own privilege, and how that is impacting our interactions with our students, mm -hmm. because the primary purpose of restorative justice is community and relationships. Mm -hmm. And if we're not gonna have that relationship and community with those particular individuals, we're not doing restorative justice. Mm -hmm. what, what is, uh, thank you for that. What, what, when you think about the number of things that ail us right now that, that, as a community, right? The, um, that there are folks that feel alienated, there are people who don't feel connected, there are people who yearn for that connection but perhaps um, have never really been in a space where they've felt it, right? What, you know, what role does restorative justice play in addressing those challenges, right? Is, it, is that the only thing that's needed right now? Like if, if, if we were to do it right, right? Would we need to do anything else? Or like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and, and again, like when we're thinking of restorative justice, it's not something we just do. Like, right. so uh, we have to get out of that thinking that it's, you know, a workshop, a training, a certification, one and done, and now we are restorative justice trained. That yeah. in itself is, is problematic in what restorative justice really is. Yeah. So when we're looking at it, it's about that community and connection. So that's an ongoing process. That's yeah. not something that can just be done once and everybody gets it because there are a lot of people who are on different journeys and are still trying to understand their own uh, bias, their own impact that they have had on individuals. Mm -hmm. And for some educators and other people in, in different um, uh, places of work, it's really hard to now think, okay, I've been doing this for so long, you're gonna now tell me I'm not doing it right? For some people, even that is hard to accept. Yeah. But we have to get to a place where our intent is really understanding who we are, who others are, and understanding their own identity and difference, and how we can connect 
but how we are also different and honor those experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that is a, a, a long process. Yeah. That's not something that happens overnight. But what I will say is that restorative justice has the unique opportunity to connect with all these other, you know, workshops and trainings that we're doing around inclusion and, and diversity and around, you know, um, anti-racism and anti-black racism. It has the ability to work collaboratively to yeah. understand relationship and community as being the priority. Mm -hmm. So listen, like you're dropping gems, um, you know, in terms of, of possible, and you're really speaking a lot to mindset. You know, we've been involved, and in, I say, you know, organization, and we've seen it happening where there are a number of, of companies and even educational institutions that are, you know, they're, they're um, striving to have, you know, this one thing. Let's, let's just put these, do these 10 things, and then that will show that we're good. That will show that we're being anti-racist. That will show that we're, uh, we're being inclusive. Um, but what I'm hearing, it, it sounds like it's more of a mindset and the work is, is ongoing, right? It's not a one-off, it's not a checklist, it's not a, a one workshop or a one certification. Um, how do you encourage people to, to be willing to engage in that long game type of thinking? when everything in today's society, especially in the West, is like, you just do it now. You have a headache, take a pill. You got, you know, something's up with your arm. You go, you know, you, you go see an, a specialist about that. How do you encourage people to take a long game approach? Uh, I mean, I think the biggest thing would be uh, impact, right? You know, uh, teaching in a youth correctional facility, teaching in, in various facilities and schools that I've been at, I've realized that there are a lot of students who have been harmed by an education system that didn't see them, that didn't value who they were. And I'm, I'm tired of seeing that. I'm frustrated with that. I'm frustrated um, having to go to a funeral or having to grieve the loss of, of a student who was killed because of gun violence. So for me, you know, it, it holds more meaning to think about restorative justice as a long-term approach because lives are literally on the line. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, when educators and other practitioners think, you know, I'm doing this right, and you have people within the black community, indigenous community, other communities saying, no, you're not. And actually, we've been harmed for two, five, 10, 20 years within our education system, and this is not working. And you're not willing to hear that you are costing lives, literally costing lives. When we think about the school to prison uh, pipeline, that is exactly what it is. When we fail to understand where we have uh, a responsibility to intentionally engage and build connection and relationships with students, and we are not doing that, we are saying that that student doesn't matter. And what often will happen is those students will find somewhere where they matter. Yeah. They will find some way where they feel a sense of power, but it may not be within our education system mm -hmm. and it could lead them to make other choices that negatively impact the trajectory of their life. Mm -hmm. So if we can really think about the fact of how are we seeing restorative justice, how are we seeing the work that we're doing um, as being meaningful and intentional and building authentic relationships mm -hmm. as a way to change the trajectory of students' lives, I think may, more people would really buy into it. You know, something that really strikes me is this, this notion about perspective. If you knew, like as an educator, as a practitioner, as a, a, a lay person, if you knew that what you were doing was impacting someone's life, like a life was on the line based on how you were showing up, I think many people would show up differently. I think many people would change their approach, even in terms of the, the energy that they bring to the activities that they do. Um, so when we're talking about journeying and the restorative justice journey, um, we're not necessarily, not necessarily speaking about getting to a destination to which we've never arrived at before. We may be actually speaking about looking through a different lens and experiencing other people's journeys, which shifts our perspectives, not just around what's possible, but around how we show up for one another and how we show up for the young people that we're called to serve or the, the colleagues that we're called to serve alongside. So as, as we exit this space, I invite you to think about what, is, what are some ways that you could show up differently that bring hope, that bring perspective. When, when you have people coming into your space and whether that's a young person or a more seasoned young person, whether it's a student or a colleague or your boss, um, understand that the way that you show up could redefine what they believe to be as possible and can also give them hope and give them life and give them reasons to make decisions that take them down this path 
versus this path. Honored to be here with you today. Yeah, Such a gift. It sounds like you want to, you have something yeah, you want to. Well, I will say too that, you know, when it comes to restorative justice and, and the challenges of implementing it, the one thing that I will say that um, Harley Eagle mentioned, who's a phenomenal uh, Indigenous leader that talks about, you know, cultural safety and cultural humility, um, and a few other people have mentioned this, is thinking about um, mirrors, windows, balconies. Uh, or mirrors, uh, yeah, mirrors or doors and balconies. And mirrors is the first thing that we need to look at. We need to reflect on our own understanding of who we are and understand our own complicity in racism and oppression that has impacted students. And then if you're looking at doors or windows, you're looking outwards to the people around you. How are you intentionally connecting with people within your community and community, school community or whatever that is? And if you are living outside of that community, if you were living in a homo homogenous community but working in somewhere that's completely diverse, what are you doing to be intentional about understanding the diversity and lived experiences of the people that you surround yourself with? And then we need to take that balcony approach that Harley Eagle talks about and looking, if you were standing on a balcony and you could actually look at the system and the structure of say the school system, what is it that you see that are um, disproportionate outcomes for students? What do you see about the inequities that exist? And how are we intentional about dismantling that? And so when we're looking from that balcony side, we need to see, you know, is there a, a um, great representation of uh, teachers that look like the community where we teach in? Is the curriculum centered on being culturally responsive? Mm -hmm. And so all of these things are really about understanding who we are, who the people are that we work with, and understanding our community. Mm -hmm. And that is all about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. So really looking mirrors, windows, doors, and balconies, and taking a whole school approach or a whole system approach and identifying the needs that we need to do to be intentional about connection. Mm -hmm. So you've heard it, it's about perspective, right? Mirrors, windows, doors, and balconies, right? The perspective that you bring as you're looking at moving the needle on these things are, are incredibly important. And you've given some some uh, uh, some very teachable, um, you know, points that folks could reflect on in terms of how they're showing up in those spaces, mirrors, windows, doors, and balconies that can help to redefine possibilities and showing up in a way that's restorative, that can help to build relationships and be centered on relationships and doing it in a spirit of togetherness and being collective. So, you know, so grateful. Uh, for you, for your time, for your insight. You've shared those tidbits just like a teacher would so that folks could remember it and, and walk away. And as you look into the mirror, um, understand your role and understand that you have a responsibility uh, to do what you can with what you have and recognize that you also, by the way that you show up, you also can shift other people's perspective so that when they look in their mirror or when they look through their window or when they look from their balcony, they're being impacted by seeds that you've planted with them by the way that you've shown up. So keep on showing up. Understand that it's, uh, it's not always easy. It's necessary. It's complicated. Until next time. <laughs>